So let's get started. Anyway, um, thanks for coming. My name is Jerry Basserman, and um, I don't work for Dave Smith, but I'm a musician, producer, keyboard player, slash something. And uh, I wanted to show you this new piece we have. You know, the, the Dave Smith line so far, at least as exemplified by what's on that wall, um, it's a remarkable company, actually. I don't know if you know the story of it. It it's, uh, goes back to the 70s. The Prophet 5 came out in the late 70s as the first programmable synthesizer, polysynthesizer. And so um, the Prophet 5 kind of started it all. And recently, in two years ago, you know, over time, Yamaha bought Sequential just like, um, who are the guys who bought Moog? Norlin bought Moog. And somebody bought someone, Big Fish Eat Little Fish. And, uh, you know, what happens then is th that takes the name away. It robs you of your name. Tom Oberheim lost his name. Uh, Dave Smith lost the name Sequential Circuits. You know, those things get bought, and then somehow they disappear, and the, and the big fish forgets that it ate the little fish. So. But uh, in our unique industry, somehow, uh, ahead of Roland Takahashi saw that Dave was making uh, instruments, evolvers, and things. And called up Yamaha and said, what are you doing with the name? Just give it to him. Just give it back to him. This is ridiculous. And the uh, non-legal thing, he just got a letter saying he can use his name sequential circuits again. So in celebration, sort of, they made the Prophet 6, which is an update to the Prophet piece of gear uh, from start to finish. Lovingly made, not on a, a LSI chip or anything, but like component by component on circuit boards. Sort of a homage to the day. And uh, it's a fantastic instrument. Um, in every way better, of course, than the Prophet 5. It's 30 years later. Uh, and then he did the uh, project with Tom Overheim. There, it's right above the blue one there, right above the Prophet 6. And that's a it looks the same, same kind of uh, template there, but very different sound. The Oberheim sound, the Oberheim filters, uh, the two-pole filters, and, and oscillator design, and so much of what Tom did. And so that's two of the instruments in the line. Um, and the one to the right of the Oberheim is an incredible monophonic synth called the Prophet 2, because the Prophet 1 was the monophonic synth back in the 80s that lots of people used. And that's just a super unique, powerful monophonic keyboard. So uh, the story of this keyboard, the brand new one, the Rev 2, the reason it's the Rev 2, it's another sort of like the 6 followed the 5. The Prophet 8 has been around for 10 years. Uh, it's been really popular instruments. Zillions of sounds exist for it on the web and that people have made. And so Dave, Dave thought it was time to, you know, sort of freshen it up after 10 years. So Eight means eight voices, just like six means six voices, right? And that's how many notes you can, how much polyphony you have. And so the first thing he thought of doing was doubling it, you know, just like why not have a, a v um, analog synthesizer with 16 voices? It's only been done once that I know of, uh, a piece called the Andromeda uh, that I think Elisa's made, um, which was really expensive and not so good. So that's, <laughs> that's not good. Um, but this, uh, this is a 16 voice, yeah, so it's, it's, so it's groundbreaking in that sense, and it exceeds its predecessor in that sense. And I'll go over it, you know, just section by section, sound by sound, and talk about other enhancements to that. But this is also a s complete uh, analog signal path, right, from start to finish. There are effects on board, and when you say effects, typically what you mean are digital effects, right? The kind of effects we've all become used to, d digital delay. Digital reverb, you know, the, the wonderfulness of all that. But um, the signal path doesn't get interrupted for that. It's at the end of the line. Um, I think that the, sig the analog signal is converted, uh, goes through the digital section to get the effects. It's con literally converted back to <laughs> analog to leave through the voltage, leave through the uh, analog outputs. Uh, and when they're not being used, the effects, it's, it's like in true bypass mode. It doesn't run through any circuitry there. It goes complete. So yeah, so um, one of the things you can do when you have all that polyphony, I mean, one thing you could do is, I suppose, play piano pieces better, but not many people play synthesizers and, and do uh, too many piano pieces or hold the sustain pedal down for those kind of effects. So one of the couple of things you can do, which this thing excels at, is stacking and, and splitting. The notion that you would have enough voices to just mound more another layer right on top of the layer you have is uh, is a powerful, uh, 
easy to conceive of, easy for people that don't even know what they're doing. It just let's just layer that up. Uh, and then splitting the keyboard. So I'm going to show you that these those controls are right here, and they're part of every uh, every patch. So why don't I just start playing the the first um, go through a number of the factory patches? There's 500 of them in a f in the four factory banks, 512, and then you have those replicated in the user banks. Uh, so the the same patches are recreated in the user banks, but those c you could wipe them out and get rid of them and make your own or you can edit them all and then leave them there but those user banks are ram based memory and so you can do what you want with them so let me just go through what some of these really expert sound designers did with the instrument and explain you know how they did it um this is called los vangeles So far, that's a, a one-layer patch, but as you can hear, and what I love about it, this is a, a, a new Fatar uh, keyboard bed. There's only like a half a dozen companies in the world that make um, keyboard beds. You don't have a lot to choose from, but the Italian company Fatar is a premium uh, producer. But this one has a longer throw than normal, uh, has aftertouch, so you can push into the keys after, but just, to, just even without mm -hmm. aftertouch, just... It's just by your expressive velocity playing how how fast or how hard you hit the notes. It it just delivers a lot of um expressivity and that's the first thing I want to say about this is a real instrument. This isn't some, you know, since uh I was going to say wank. I hope that's okay. Can I say wank here? Synth wank machine. This is a player, you know, a keyboard player will love this because it's expressive. Um, but it's only one layer, and, and I thought it was kind of funny since layering is such a big deal here. And I thought to myself, well, is there even anything uh, on the other layer? Do I turn on stack, which is the way you access layer B? And I play it again. And I start to hear this animation, this sort of cinematic animation idea. that you can say oh, what is that that's appearing all of a sudden and I hit edit layer B so a and B are the two layers and in this uh, now that I hit edit layer B I'm only gonna hear B <laughs> got an arpeggiator going right got like all the guys whistling at the girls Yeah, it might be a little. It might be a little loud. I can just go in and say, you know, that layer for what I'm doing. I just want it to, to be a little more subtle. I'm going to reduce it slightly. So it's just the sense of it. Now I'm going to go back to stack and see how that works. This is super remote now, like sort of in back of things. But I mean, that's like not heavy programming, right? A lot of this instrument it ends up being that simple because layering and splitting is a s simple concept. And then if you know, if you want to actually turn it into a split, you could say, well, I just want to, or I can do this, this thing where it's then divide it and it's super easy to set the split point uh, I'll go over a lot of pre programs that have that but that's the idea here is you you have enough polyphony enough voices you're never going to hear one get robbed you're never going to hear a release that ends abruptly because that cha channel was stolen for the next voice it's just a it's just a, um, a beautiful easy thing um, now here's another program where similar kind of thing one of these layers is really acting up so 
when I explore that, I see there's this layer B is actually the pad, right? So it's layer A that... Here I want to do a similar thing where... I'm going to actually reduce the amplifier so it's, it's not as loud and ask my velocity. Now my velocity is going to bring that up. So when I hit the keyboard soft, I really won't hear it. When I hit it louder, I'll hear it uh, more. And then the other thing I can do is go to the modulation matrix and say, what about this aftertouch thing? If I press into the keyboard while I'm holding a chord, can I influence it? You know, so I'm, I'm going to go to this modulation matrix and I'm going to go and dial up one of the slots. There's like 13 slots where you can connect this source to this destination. The source is going to be, they call pressure. Aftertouch is called pressure. And then the destination, all I have to do is hold the destination button and go find my, my uh, envelope amount, touch it, and it becomes the destination. And I'll turn that up a bit. So... <laughs> bring it out by and it feels like I, I i swear it feels like there's a quarter inch of stuff like foam that i'm pushing into and you can actually feel the resistance so so anyway uh let me go back to the to the stack and say and the, and the, and the pad layer has the vibrato coming in too right so it's like There's all these ways to make it more and more expressive if you want. Now, if you use this with a computer because, you know, you have some DAW running on your computer and, and, and you have a lot of in songs, I mean, sounds inside your com computer that you like and you use, and then you have this, you can access this. It's called bitambral. So it's not just one MIDI channel. Two, two MIDI channels would, would address each of the layers. So you'd have layer A and layer B if you want them to be separate parts. That's how you you could use it in, in real time. Um, and now we have a split. So this, and I can tell just because you can even, s I don't know if you can see, but this, this area right here is what we're talking about. That middle button stack, the top one is split. So I can tell already that I have some sound on the left. It's always sound A. like it because I'm all of a sudden getting to the bass sound and it's I'm way up here. I want instantly to change that. So, so just going to go hold split, touch that, and now I know that my lead sound is five is four octaves here and this only the octave is that. So there's a lot of this where I touch the source and I touch a control and it's mapped. Or I touch the split and I touch a note, it's mapped. It's a lot faster. You can do it in the menu. It's like has redundant ways to do things, but that takes a little time. You twiddle in the dot, you know, dial and stuff. So when you learn these kind of shortcuts, then you move a little faster with the piece. So now, you know, I can just. Uh, what else do we have in here? Now, there's sequencers on board, too. Lots of instruments have sequencers on board, and sometimes, like the Prophet 8 had a sequencer on board, but that sequencer uh, specialized, instead of lots of notes to make a song that way, it specialized in being four tracks of modulation data that would be very rhythmic. So you press the sound, and it's not just a sustaining sound, it's like a whatever you program for the filters now jumping and, and now the, uh, the uh, sh os oscillator shape might be moving. So this is uh, that gated sequencer that, that's come to the uh, Rev 2. <laughs> Play 
play, it's, it's almost like a sample, like a rhythmic sample. If you had a rhythmic sample, every time you re-trigger it, you get that nice first sound. Uh, but in but in fact, it's, it's, this is a synth, it's not a sample. And so you can actually override and end up on, as long as you know what tempo you're in, you can do that. Um, now the gated sequencer is there so that you can read any of those Profit 8 patches. So any of them over 10 years that have been developed by whoever, sold by professionals or developed by your friends or by yourself because you have an 8, all those patches you can just load into here and they'll, and they'll play, sounding exactly the same. So is it essentially the same sequencer then? Well, the gated... No, the gated one's exactly the same, but Dave wanted to add a second sequencer, so you have an option. There's two sequencers, yeah. You can't use them at the same time, but you can, one's called gated, one's called poly. And the poly one is more like the Prophet 2 one, where, where I think it's um, six, uh, 32 steps and six tracks. And you can actually play, play notes in. So the gated one's more for like what you heard wasn't a lot of notes, even though it sounded like it. It's like abrupt changes in the resonance and the filter and stuff will make it sound like it's smacking a new sound or going immediately with that oscillator frequency to a new frequency sounds like you're playing a new note, but all you're doing is driving a parameter. So that's what the gated sequencer is. The poly one, no, you enter those notes, you know. <laughs> play in the thing, step by step it gets recorded. So every one of these patches has, um, each layer can have its own sequencer too. Each layer can have its own effects too. So the layers are really uh, individual and unique and they can run two of the effects at the same time because you can stack them. Two, yeah. But I can't play a poly, uh, poly, like before when we were checking the sound, that was, I was just going through the sequences. You can actually turn it on, I'll just go to the middle of one of these 500, and let's hear what squishy bass, uh. Every, everyone would be heading for the exits actually. I'm changing patches, but the sequencer keeps playing. Okay, spooky, 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 spooky. All right, let's continue. Let's continue. Yeah, so anyway, that's a, that's a cool thing. Pro and if I want to go to split, now you can see which part of that rhythmic thing was which. So layer A sounds like... Without the goom, 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 those tom-tom, like, synthetic things. Here, here they come. That's not tom-toms. split a stack that it's really easy to do different things than are possible in a so so yeah if you're playing in a band or a project or something like that you know you can make up the exact sound you want or you might use the split thing because you do this part in the verse and you do this this sound in the chorus and you don't even have to think about turning the knob or choosing a preset because it's much easier to just go up here and do it. So there's a lot of ways to make that simple. Um, so you can have a, a, a sequencer on both layer A and layer B? Yeah. And it can be either of the sequencers? Like They're totally separate. Yeah. One could be gated, one could be poly, or two. they could be two poly or two gated. Or gated. Yeah. Which I think is, is what that was. Gated, and when I hit edit B, gated. Yeah. So... Okay, here's Discovery Pad. So when I was playing with the module and I was playing that, I thought it was so beautiful, Discovery Pad and everything. I said, oh, somebody did a really good job. Then I said, well, let me find out what's on layer B. And I hit the thing and it's like, Nothing is on layer B. This is preset five. How could nothing? They already burned it into the memory and everything. So I had discovered an error, a big error. And I had to report it to them. I, and 
had to find out what w w what little thing is prohibiting the sound and it ends up being in the amplifier section you know you know what an envelope is an envelope is the shape of the sound so um every sound has an envelope a trumpet if, if you look at the way the waveform looks when it hits that that initial attack has all this energy big spike and then it kind of settles fast right that's the envelope it, uh, piano sound also pre pretty hard attack string sounds when they're coming up up bow and everything it's like looking like it you know it's growing so that's what these parameters are for attack decay sustain and release they help you shape the sound there's two of them here anyway one of them is the amount of the envelope you want to apply and it turns out to be totally down and when I turn that up so now when I go back and I put it into this mode I hear that discovery pad Actually, I would start playing with it and make it do something different. You can also put delays. Every, uh, each, there's, in fact, there's three envelopes. There's filter, amp, and, and auxiliary. They all have delay. So it could be you put layer B is there, but it doesn't start its, its amp thing until a second or two into the sound. So actually, most of the time you're playing, you're playing this one sound, and as you hold it, it starts to then unravel and, and wrap. So... So it really is a discovery pad. That's right. That's right. You're, you're very on tonight. Now make sure that you get a ticket for your, your Curtis filter. <laughs> See, now this one is, is a funny one. It's called Play Nice. And I thought, what is that in Play Nice? And I was like, is this a clavichord or is I, I'm supposed to play Bach, or, but I was so stupid because the minute I said, let's see what the sound designer really meant, and I hit the play button on the sequencer, and it's all like, you know, completely, oh yeah, this is a funky class match. How could I not get that? So this, see, they just live here. It, every programmer did a poly or a gated one. Yeah, so, they, so that tells you what the person who created that was thinking. Yeah. It was a little, it, you know what, I think it was like a vintage take on back in the day because it was really kind of dull. And if I turn up the key amount in the filter, that means as I go up the keyboard, it's getting brighter all the time, like some instruments do naturally. So you don't have to even turn the cutoff up. You just turn key amount, and it starts to generously apply, you know, back off the, uh, the turn up the cutoff frequency. That sounds more uh, current than, than the other. I mean, unless you got it wet with the resonance and went you're like all Dr. Q about it. So anyway, play nice. Yeah. But there's 500 of these things. I can't possibly just go on and on with them. Uh, uh, maybe. Do one more. Break it down, break it down, split it up. Yeah, so one layer is only that driving kick drum, right? Which is basically the filter, you know, heavy resonance. You know what resonance is? The thing that makes it sound like juicy and, and wacka, wacka, wacka. It's just this emphasis on one energy point. It's somewhere in the frequency, it's getting all this energy. And so sometimes you can blow your ears out if you find the wrong frequency and it's all super resonant and it's like, oh my God, that note just knocked me. In this case, it's making this synthetic kick drum that so finds its, its target. And up here is the... Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, there's a lot you can do with it. You know, um, 
When you hear someone playing this instead of an electric piano kind of organ set up on stage in a band, a lot of times you, you hear why a synth is, is, so, is so cool. It, it really, all the flavors makes the, makes the song happen, right? A lot of the other instruments are play around a, a smaller tonal place, guitars and stuff, and they're, they're genre based and we know what they sound, you know, they're great. But when you hear the synth, being different in each song and stuff, it's, it's, they're very wide amount of things you can do. Anyway, you guys can also ask questions like, like this gentleman, he, he, he just use his model, yeah. Do you have like a little jam with that one? That yeah, there must be something. No, it's gated. That's how we're getting it. I just did it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never did it before, but I mean, I, you know, I, I want to be real for you guys. I don't practice. <laughs> I don't practice this, no. One question about the, the effects. Um, can you, it's possible to layer, for example, one effect in one, just one layer and the other to get dry, or it has to be two both? No, you know, you could be on and off with the effect. You don't have to use it. No, I mean, uh, if you do want to use, for example, a delay just for the layer A, but layer B if you want it dry, is that possible? Yeah, yeah. So you can have an effect on each layer, yep. Exactly. So, so let me just go about making some sounds because these are all like just done. All you do is hold down three buttons and you get a basic program. A basic program is just like a waveform and everything else is sort of default or neutral, right? Um, sometimes these synths, in fact, I think the Prophet 6 has a manual mode which means live mode. You hit that button, and whatever you see is what you get. So wherever the knobs are sitting, that's going to be wh what you're getting at that point, which is, you know, it, it's just cool enough, except you have to, if you want to start from scratch like this, it's easier to hit basic program and know that on everything is zeroed, like a, like a mixer that's zeroed. You, you know that there's no EQ, and there's, you know, uh, you don't have to wonder later why something's happened. Anyway, we're starting with the basic sawtooth wave. <laughs> has a huge range, 10 octave range. And the reason you hear it sort of staircase like that is because it's, it's uh, on a coarse frequency mode, which means A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D. We're not like, you don't have to wonder, you know, where are you? If you want to tune it, you, you can see where it is. So I think the normal default for this is C2. So that's where we're going to leave it uh, for now. Now you have all these waveforms to choose from. Sawtooth, the first one, sawtooth has a nice sharp, bright, a lot of bright frequency. The next one is sawtooth plus triangle, a little not so bright. The next one, triangle, a little not so bright, even more. And pulse. Okay, now pulse can become a square wave when you put uh, half positive and half negative. So I'll put the shape mod in the center and that's your square wave that you can see, like people make clarinets and things like that with those. Now, each of these can be so conditioned. So if I go like this with the shape mod, and wiggle it like I had nothing better to do than stand there all day and do this, um, I could make this sound that's really rich because it's got all that animation. Well, you don't have to stand there all day because you can automate that, of course. You can take one of these low frequency oscillators and you can say, okay, Destination of this one is going to be oscillator one shape. You hear that like changing that it's doing? I mean, if I made it obnoxious, be your gold crowns start to, you know, extricate themselves. Now, one thing is low frequency oscillators normally just go up to 20 hertz. They are very, s like you'd, you'd use it for a violin, a vibrato. That's not that fast. That's, I don't know, I don't know what the hertz is of that. Six, yeah, six or something hertz, yeah. But, but that, you couldn't he hear a frequency that's six hertz. It's below our hearing. 20, they say, is what you can hear, but that's super down there. So, 
But when you say that this oscillator now goes above 20, then you're saying it goes into the audio spectrum. And the minute you do that, <laughs> you hear those like other, like the ships taking off from the planet. It's, it's like those are side bands. And so you've got your fundamental, but now there's these other ones that are like, no, dude, we have energy too. We're all taking off. And then the, more, the faster you make that go, the more... <laughs> So you can really create mayhem, and then we just began. I mean, we only touched two knobs so far. Imagine what four can sound like. <laughs> no. Yeah, when you generate enough energy to other frequencies that they, they don't compete with, but now they have their own fundamentals, then they're, they're like their own notes, like you're playing a chord. So they, ha they establish themselves, but even beyond that, so there's AM and FM, so you can do it like this. Um, here we're just modulating the shape of the waveform, so it's neither AM or it's not frequency modulation and it's not amplitude modulation. It's, what kind of modulation is it? Well, yes, waveform modulation. <laughs> Very good. If it was a, if it was a pulse wave, you'd call it pulse wave, mod, you know, modulation, because that's kind of more famous. Anyway, you can do that with any with any of these. I'm going to turn the amount down because we don't really want that. But <laughs> but you can do a lot with these oscillators before you even go to the filter. Everyone loves to talk about filters. Right? We all love the fil the sound of that filter is just so, oh, the filter to filter. You can stay with the oscillators and do an awful lot of damage. So let's, we haven't even turned on number two yet. Um, oh, I thought it was a, another sound. Okay. So now let's, that's on pulse. We're going to turn one on to uh, sawtooth. Okay, now you could tune it to something else besides C. It doesn't have to be C. It could be G. <laughs> right? That's just a fifth. And you can mix it. You can say, I don't want that much of that. <laughs> now there's only a little bit of that second one. You can barely hear that it's there. Now it just sounds like it's part of the tone. Because if you're turning it down, it's just a rich harmonic on that tone, right? Or you can do something like this, how you make an electric piano. If I turn it to uh, like um, a triangle, um, both of these to triangle. There, it's not, it's me, it's not the keyboard. Now I've got the oscillator mix on 9 o'clock, which means it's mostly one with a little bit of two in there. You hear it's just up there. And if I turn on sub octave, so that's sub octave. If you want beef underneath, now, what normally happens is when you find out a sub -oc octave, you just turn it on everything. Of course I need that. I need more of that. But that's not true. Because a lot of these sounds, you know, your, your engineer is just going to take it out in the mixer anyway. <laughs> they don't want it there. They don't want your sound gobbling up all the frequencies. So, but when you're playing by yourself and you want that rumble, you know, then that's what... But you have it. You have it, and you could you could even modulate it. And so something happens that when you put the mod wheel up forward, you add bass. You know, you could do that. Just and then there's noise, <laughs> right? So and you can, and you could actually turn all this stuff down and say I don't want anything but noise. <laughs> and what am I going to do with that? I mean, one thing you could do is say, let's turn it from that noise to like a little click or something. I have this, I have this, um, and then you could also, I have this patch that I did where I tried to make a shuffly 
cool um, thing, and I don't know that it turned out that way, but the, you know, they're always in there. You're never finished with them, so you say, it doesn't matter because I'm not really finished with it yet. Uh, where is it? 109, isn't it? Yeah, Swish Bass Man, right? Yeah. No, it's cooler than I thought, actually. I was like, ready to be embarrassed, and then it was like, no, that's pretty cool. But that's all just noise. That's one layer that is on a gated sequence, and I did the thing where I kind of opened the filter up in a certain way and then edited it. And So you, you can actually use these for musical purposes. Um, is this your personal uh, profit revenue? No, <coughs> but you can, you can take your work anywhere <coughs> because... Ha ha! But you know, yeah, you. Okay. I'll show you some of the some of the stuff. There's something called sysex in MIDI, and MIDI is the language that all these instruments can talk to each other in. Usually has this five. Uh, you can't see it up there, but there's a five pin din um, where I can come out of here and go into that first one, and I'm playing that one from here, and I can do other kinds of things. And you connect to your computer that way. So sysx is specifically about um, the parameters that are set, the knobs, where were they placed. And when you dump a program or send a program, it means you're sending sysx data. And so there's this thing called sysx librarian here. And all I have to do is say, I, I made that patch, and I'm going to press global. I get a menu of stuff. One of them is dump program. Or it could be dump everything. And then I put this in receive mode, and then it just takes it and then I name it and also you know what I did I was so excited that I would be coming down to get this I thought this would be so stupid to have my laptop there this big thing you you, you mean you hauled that around just so you could put sounds in this thing I said no I'm gonna use my phone there must be an app for this there's an app for everything so I went and I saw there was there's a sys it's called sysx base and it was 10 bucks and I thought that's okay it doesn't matter I'm gonna be so much cooler, but just be like, yeah, you do this. But as it turns out, I can't find the cable that makes it work. <laughs> so <laughs> isn't that stupid? So now everything's great except that. Yeah, the USB B. So there's USB A, there's USB B, and looking for the cable, and I put it together with like adapters and stuff, and it should be cool, but. There's no Bluetooth. <laughs> You're right. There's no Bluetooth. And there's no Alexa. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Talk to it. Wait, is the spring reverb in this one? No, no, the spring is not there. Here, let me drop it so we can yeah, check. Yeah. Um, but another thing that is cool <coughs> is this thing. All these instruments come with this uh, sound tower makes an editor librarian. Uh, all that means is all the parameters that you're seeing here, there, are on, here, let me put this down, I'm, I'm dying, um, are right there in front of you. So if you looked at a patch and your computer, you know, monitor, you'd be like, oh, I see what's wrong. Oh, that's not, oh, and it's fun to create on, in this environment if you're used to your computer and stuff. Uh, you don't get the knobs, but. So then you can also store patches, uh, and you don't think of it as sysx because not now it's, it's this data that you're transferring. It is sysx, but. Yeah, and then you can also organize your sounds. Like right now, they're just in these banks, user one, user two, user three. Okay, but they're not sorted. They don't say basses, strings, crazy, and, you know, jugular or something. So you can't, you know, sort them and find them. The other thing this thing does, there's a screen called Program Genetics. And if you can think of a mommy program and a daddy program of two that you love here and you'd love to find the program that's sort of in the middle, has the qualities of this one and some of the qualities of that one, then it'll help you find that because it'll use this sort of genetic model. You can actually say, don't touch these two parameters. I actually want that to stay the same. But these other ones sort of uh, randomize like a controlled randomization. And then you come up with a batch of like 20 children, 
Mommy, daddy, children. And then you pick it. Yeah, you go through the children. Some will suck. Some will really suck. There's no doubt, right? But some are cool. <laughs> and you wouldn't have thought of them. So um, there's a lot of stuff like that in there. So it's a pretty cool program. This one's called the Rev2 um, Editor Librarian. And there's to this one. And then there's the one for the OB and there's the one for the Pro Prophet 2. Um, I haven't figured that out yet. It's called Sound Tower, so I either two guys, but are they totally separate from DSI? Yeah. Okay. So then they're separate. Yeah, and it's actually the the beta of it because uh, this is just so new. Yeah. So anyway, but anyway, yeah. So you can get into this patch making thing and. and I'm sorry. Uh, is that included with the profit or is? No, I think it's like a forty nine dollar thing that you get. It's a software. So. Um, so I want to go back to my thing because we didn't really get into any, any of the um, kind of uh, envelopes or, or filter things. So let me just <coughs> go to, let me shape this into almost like a, a string sound. Now I'm turning up the attack and the, the, and the release. There's also something in here, uh, a, an, a feature called slop. And slop means, back in the day when you had these voltage controlled oscillators, um, they were unstable, which meant uh, they, when they warmed up, they changed their pitch. So imagine, you know, you're there on stage and, and you thought it was in tune and then now you come back after the break and it sounds like hell. Because those voltage controlled oscillators were not stable and they reacted to temperature and all kinds of things. So Dave started making at some point, instead of, they're called VCOs, voltage controlled oscillators, he started making DCOs, digitally controlled oscillators. They're just the clock part that tells them what pitch to be is digital. It doesn't vary, it do doesn't destabilize, it's a number kind of situation. Uh, and then some people were like, oh dude, not analog. That's not VCO, I, you know, I don't go there. I don't, you know, I don't roll. So, uh, but it, <laughs> so, so Dave was like, well, okay, you missed that old fuzzy, foamy, you know, old analog thing. I'll put in oscillator slop. So if you, let me open up the filter a little bit. That's got about a quarter of the oscillator slop in it. So it's an, it's an algorithm. It's not just a simple detune. It actually is. Sometimes it goes a little wilder than others. He's tr he made, made something that apes the idea that VCOs go out of tune. So you can program that in uh, as you like. I thought it was kind of funny that he did that. But... Um <laughs> now this is a, a four-pole... Uh, filter. And this is another thing people are very uh, precious about. You know, the only filter I use is the Moog ladder filter. It's, it's the glorious four pole, 24 dB per octave, very steep, very powerful. It's so powerful that when you turn the resonance up, it can become a new note and self oscillate. And, and it has this mystique about it too, because Bob Moog, uh, you know, here's the story. A composer went to Bob Moog. All these guys who designed synths had like partner music people. And the guy who, who Bob Moog listened to was named Herb Deutsch. He's still alive. He went up, he was interested in this newfangled thing in the, you know, in the, in the 60s that was going on. So he said, can you make me a sound that goes woo, woo, woo? That's the story. It's in the books. 
And Bob went away and thought about it. What would I do with the sound to make it sound like that? And um, he came up with his famous ladder filter, which is a four-pole filter. It's very steep, and it does all those things. Now, the Oberheim synths have two-pole filters. And it's not like four is better than two, and then wouldn't six be nice? It's like they just sound different. They, the the uh, two-pole uh, filter sounds kind of foamy and... and uh, it's lighter. It's, it's like using something in your tea that's not as heavy a, t a flavor. It's a lighter flavor. And for strings and some other things Oberheim's famous for, it was just the perfect thing. And when you do those same sounds with a four, the magical four-pole filter, it sounds very obvious and kind of too cloaked in... So <laughs> the good news is there's a button. <laughs> you want two or four. You can have either one uh, on the filter here. So you can have your... You can have your cake and eat it too. So in this sound I'm making, that sounds a lot more cloaked, right? Now if I t turn off the four pole and make it too it's like more revealed, right? There's a little more air in the room or something about it. Um, and it's not just that the cutoff frequency is different, it's that the nature of the filter is just different. It doesn't... It's a different filter, like kind of filter. It, it's the same filter, it's, it's, it's modeling the Curtis filter, but, it's, but it's, um, it's actually taking away two of those poles. So, so 24 dB per octave means if you set the cutoff frequency here, then it actually lasts, but it's going to die away by about here. That's the four pole. This uh, two pole, Actually, yeah, and li allows all these ones to live. Uh, the one at home in your stereo, if you ever had one of those that was a stereo unit, and, you, and it said tone, and you said bass and, and high, that one's one pole. So that's just really gentle. It's cheaper, you know. It, it, it really gentle. But it's invisible, too. It's cool because it's, you don't hear that you're doing it, really. So the more gentle it is, the more discreet it is. The more sharp it is, the more kind of obvious it is. But we love the obviousness if we play synths because that's it's all about, you know, synthetic thing. You put your flag up and you're like, I'm doing this, you know. So um, anyway, I want to move on to some of these... Um, Yeah. Um, so has the noise, the noise, or is that like its own oscillator noise? Yeah, noise generator. Noise generator. Yeah. Has that changed at all in the last, since like the profit away? We were just discussing if the noise sounded better or not. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a little more scientific. You know, there's no such thing as perfect white noise. There's like, um, you'll see in the profit too, you see in the Prophet too that there's red, they call red noise, and there's all, because all noise means is every frequency is represented at the same, uh, and it, it, it's theoretical, because you can't really create it, analog or digital. So that's why you don't hear a pitch, because there's no, frequ no frequency that stands up with that much energy, right, unless you use the resonance in your filter. So then there's pink noise, and then there's these other noise. Well, they're not quite, you know, flat. They have some bumps and, you know, things. But it's still nothing that makes you hear a pitch. So that's what noise is. It, that's a good question. Is noise better than it was before? Is, it, is this a different... I think it's a fairly easy thing to implement um, with the right components. And these guys have been doing it for so long. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that anyone says that white noise is better than that white noise. It might be if you own a bunch of synths. It could be that you feel on, on one level that that one instrument makes better, better stuff with it than others. So then there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Anyway, I want to show you the effects because they've got a ton of, of uh, digital effects that... Anyway, the effects are off here. So let's turn them on and do some, some work. Let's get to work, people. <laughs> So this is a delay. There's three kinds of delays. This is a mono delay, and the parameters are what you'd expect. How much uh, is the delay time, the space between the repeats, the echoes, and then how long will they last for? So the, this first one...
And then if I turn up the feedback, and if I turn down the delay time, that's with a long bunch of feedback. And the mix is up too, so let me turn that down. So now you just don't hear it as much. If I turn it up half, it's really living on. In fact, some of these patches you think have a gated sequencer on because they're re really groovy to play, and then you look and it's not there. And then you're like, the arpeggiator's not on, what's doing it? And it, dollars to donuts, it's in, it's in that delay. Now there's also on anything to do with time, everywhere, the LFOs, um, the arpeggiator, the sequencer, the effects, have a thing called clock sync. And when you have the clock sync button pressed, that means there's, there's a whole section called clock here, and it, it's this, where's the, you see something, um, yeah, there it is. That blinker, that tells you basically what the grid is, what the beat is inside this machine right now. And when you choose clock sync on anything here, oh, then it has some relationship to the thing you're seeing blinking. And which means if you've got like a, a killer drum machine over there that you've midi that you've midied in so that everything here uh, clocks to that tempo, that's cool because then that means all my delays are, are in with that. My LFOs are doing their pumping back and forth is in that. The uh, everything the arpeggiator is doing something. It could be doing instead of every sixteenth note or every quarter note, it could be doing a dotted quarter or a dotted eighth. For those of you who know a little bit about theory, all that means is it's not so simple and 2-4. It's like cool and groovy. The, the dotted rhythm will sound like the funky drummer. You know, by comparison with a straight, I'm, I'm going, it's hard to describe. Um, yeah, if there's something else going on. It's like when your windshield wipers are out, but they're looking sexy. You know, it's like somehow, I like that. I like that. I don't know why. <laughs> They're looking good. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so when I change this time parameter, instead of just seeing arbitrary numbers, now I'm turning it and it's saying eighth dot. It's saying quarter T triplet. It's saying those things. And when you know you're in there, then it's not a simple relationship with the, with the main beat. It's this other cool one. It'll come around maybe every six or something, and it'll jive up with it. But it'll sound like a drummer who's being funky. It, anyway, it, it's a good thing. Press your clock sync buttons now. <laughs> Get them going. And so and how, how many of them are there scattered around the prophet? Well, there's... Um, there's clock sync in the LFOs. There's clock sync in the effects. I thought there was another one. Is there like one like no, because that's not a time-based thing as much. The envelopes are in fact time-based, but you wouldn't hear those changes as corresponding to the, it's the repetitive things that you really hear. Like if the drums were playing and these things are, are running on their own clock, it's going to kind of sound ridiculous and chaotic and maybe just what you want, but it, you know, beware because the other one sounds like it's like you thought about it <laughs> for a little bit. <laughs> um, so that's a good thing. That's a good thing to have. So, so anyway, you get those in these delays and you have two more kinds of delays, a digital delay and a um, bucket brigade delay, which is just different styles of making a, a delay. <laughs> Anyway, we move on to the chorus. Chorus rate, chorus depth. That's without it. With it, chorus is giving you this sense of much more um, ensemble feeling. Um, phasers.
then you have your reverb. Then you get uh, ring mod. And this ring mod is actually useful because most ring mods, they have no relation to the key that you would be playing. So it would be a truly um, disassociated sort of effect. But this, the very first parameter allows you to say keyboard tracking on or not. And if keyboard tracking is not on, then... <laughs> Every note's a different uh, reaction to the uh, ring mod, but now that it's on, <laughs> so you know all these effects like decimate and and uh, a sample rate and and uh, uh, di just distortions of every kind. Uh, ring mod is just a truly a unique flavor. <laughs> I mean, it's different than a distortion, right? It has a real flavor. Uh, ring modulation has a real flavor. It's a kind of amplitude modulation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, especially if you do these fast things. Right? It has this threatening and then not threatening thing. Um, then, there's d then there is distortion, right? Where you can... You can really break it up. You can get it to really destroy itself. Is it the um, same slop as the prophecy? Yeah. yeah, the slop is the same. But the distortion um, is different. Yeah. So where did these distortions go? Or where did it, was it like a third party coming in that kind of thing? No. No. Uh, Tom, Tom Oberheim has one of the phasers in there. Uh, Dave wrote some of the other ones. Most of the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's distortion on some of the other keyboards, and I think he used those. Yeah, yeah. And then the last thing is the high pass filter that actually lives in. Let me get another. Um, yeah, so now a low pass filter. Low pass means it lets the lows through and it closes down from the top. So if you want to have something like a filter sweep. You're closing down from high to low. The high pass filter, which is the last effect I'm showing you, is totally the opposite. It's, it, it lets the highs live, and it takes out the bass, unless you bring it down to the bass. So let's turn that up. It should be all the way up. That's using both the high pass filter and the low pass filter and trying to make different resonant peaks happen. But those are the effects. You can reverb, the delays, the phasers, the flangers, the chorus, the distortion ring mod, and high pass filter. That's all of them. I didn't forget any. That's all of them. <laughs> all right.
Now, there's a lot of stuff in the modulation matrix you wouldn't think, too. Yes, of course, you can, can make it louder and softer if you play harder. And yes, of course, you can use the mod wheel to add the highs with the thing. And yes, there's a lot of things that are stock in trade in synth synthesizer music. But some of these um, sources and destinations are a little crazy in here. So if I go, for example, to an empty mod slot and I turn on source and I look for what's in there, um, sequencer tracks can be sent there. Um, any of the envelopes, there's three envelopes, can be sent to shape anything else uh, on the board, and including the audio out. So you can take what appears at these jacks as a modulating source, and then go, go back into the machine and modulate the filter with that audio output. That, that can really, that's mayhem. I mean, that, that can be total, total mayhem. <laughs> Let's just see if I can prove that. It's like a feedback loop. It's like the audio output is now driving the control in the cutoff frequency. I actually have a patch that is, is, I made a dirty horn, and I called it dirty horn just because it was this effect. It's super subtle as opposed to that. Here, dirty horn. I want to make a brass. You hear that little thing? It's almost like somebody stuck their hand, like in a French horn. You put your hand in there, you get this kind of... That's all the um, audio out coming back to influence the cutoff frequency. But more that F than the G next to it. So I love the sort of randomness of it too that I... And when you play two notes together, then you're entering uh, an harmonic distortion as well. So um, there's a lot of uh, things that happen. The last thing I'm going to show you is how you can get FM effects that sound very digital out of here. It's with a special knob called Audio Mod. Um, I made some, some uh, bells that I want you to hear. You yeah. And all it means is the turn up the audio mod, and again, you have something that is modulating the filter, and in this case, it's oscillator one, so. So just like you can in FM synthesis, which is totally digital, um, the reason that works is because when you use all numbers, you can get exact relationships set up which equal exact results, and you can predict that. Um, in, in analog world, it ha hasn't been that easy to do that ever. Um, but now that things are way more stable, and you have guys like Dave implementing audio mod in the filter, then you can have something that you can play with, which really sounds like, like it has a million possibilities in it. Usually people say that hyperbolically. But I think it's actually true here because there's enough knobs and settings to, you can probably go where no other person has gone before. Yes? Uh, a couple of questions. You play a really nice soft lead yeah. mm. and in a really low bass. Soft. Did you say soft with the lead thing? Yeah, one of those really mellow, you know. Uh-huh. Well, we're going to try. We're going to try because w once a request comes in... Yeah, no, I know. I have a sound that I like, but then I'll make it sound more like what you said. I like this sound. This sounds like Jeff Beck to me.
I w oh. Yeah, that's not so mellow, is it? Yeah, it's got that endless. Let's see where the. Oh, oh and all the LFOs are off. All right, let's start with another preset that's not as absolutely <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> it's absolutely Jeff, man. probably bigger than you're than you're thinking I know what you mean sometimes and it's true with with synths yeah they put so much in and then for you to go and design something that's simple and like maybe small it's really funny because this this unison mode that they let you make the, you said big bases right this unison mode that that they give you to stack all the voices up you know you just feel like you have to do it you know it has to be all the voices have to get you know completely added together. Let me just find that bass. Um, yeah. Now unison is on, which means I've basically turned the whole machine into a monophonic synth. All the voices ganged up together on the one thing. But then somebody showed me, they're like, well, how many voices did you put on that? I said, I assume it's all of them. No. You have to go look at the menu and see how many of uh, uh, in unison mode are being stacked. So it says eight voices, and I, and I said, well, but why wouldn't you want to use 16? <laughs> it's like, and they're like, well, just because it sounds different. You know, they're looking at me like I'm a cretin, you know, and I felt like it too, because I was like, I always use all of them. That's unison mode with one. Now it's still in, it's still in mono mode. Now I'll put two voices. Three, four, five. Now, if you detune them, which is the very next setting, yeah, they're detuned too with an arbitrary number. So let's detune them four. Yeah, so it just gets huger and huger and huger. But I, I also eat everything on my plate. You know, I'm, uh, that's just who I am. The, the guy was like, it sounded best at five. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's, at, it's on eight. Yeah. Can you um, use unison on one side of the split and not the other? Like yeah. Like the yeah. Yep, let's see. <laughs> I said yes first. <laughs> <I should've laughs> <laughs> Shoot first, ask questions later. No. Okay, so B has none. Yeah. And A has one, and B has none. Yeah. So, absolutely. Now, the thing is, if you use five or three or something short of eight, you don't get to use those voices then. It's not, I, I was like, well, can I play an another note then? No. Once you say a unison, you're in unison mode and all the playing things that go along with it, which, if you want a solo sound, it's really the best thing to do. 
So um, any other questions? I'm trying to think. It cost $2,000. The 16-voice version cost $2,000. The 8-voice version, because they make an 8-voice version, has exactly the same functionality, costs 1500 And then there's like a $500 kit you can get later when you say, oh, I should have gotten the 16. <laughs> Uh, and you can get it, and you don't have to send it anywhere. You open it up, there's screws, you take it out, and it's just a n another daughter board that you just plug into the one that's there. And so it's user installable. Is there a model? Yeah, what did they say to say about that? Because I know they're, they're working on it, but I'm not supposed to say that. So what was it that I was supposed to say? No, yeah, because there's modules for everything. The, the OB has a really nice looking module, and the, uh, so it, it makes sense. People have too many keyboards and stuff. So, yeah, I didn't, you weren't here, I wasn't here, but <laughs> it's there. <laughs> it's there. So, yeah, um, I can do one on one too. Um, for anyone who wants to play it, come on up and play it. And um, it's very easy, it's likable. And thank you all for coming. Thank all right. Thank you.